Hello and welcome to Early Years Workshop. The experts with me today are Jan de Beel, the Principal Officer for the Foundation Stage Profile from National Assessment Agency, Diane Rich from Rich Learning Opportunities, and today we've got Chris Ross, who's a practitioner from Evesham Nursery School. In today's programme, we're going to be talking about how and why children pose questions. So, where do we start? Well, I think children are asking questions all the time. Children are natural explorers, and in their explorations of all the things they do, they're asking questions. Questions aren't always said, but they're implied in what the, the child is actually mm. doing. It's really important for practitioners to develop that skill of understanding when children are engaged in questioning, even if that questioning is naturally articulated by observing their levels of involvement by looking at how they interact with other children, by looking at where their thinking is actually taking them. It's easy to recognise the routine and procedure type questions they ask. Can I go to the toilet now? When is mummy coming to collect me? That kind of question. But what we're really thinking about is the questions that children ask when they're explorers, explorers of their world. You're always asking questions at Evesham Nursery, aren't you? We are, and you often find the children, like you say, are asking questions, but in many different ways. Wow, Chris, weren't they enjoying themselves? They what are. What's happening? We have access to um, water at Evesham outside, um, which is a, a great resource. I mean, that particular day, that's what they'd chosen to do. Yes. And you were there, Diane, mm. weren't you? I was. I was very fortunate on that day. Um, what I was impressed with was the way children could make decisions for themselves. And you didn't mind them getting wet. They could be in control of the tap, the water could go wherever, it could go on their shoes, on their feet, get their socks wet, yes. but they were genuinely exploring water. What does it feel like? How can I use it? Um, I think there's this lovely magicness of water that, that engages their emotions. And they're so concentrated, aren't they? The focus is very high in all these activities that they're choosing to do themselves. That's what I really like. There was no time, really, I saw an adult intervene. You don't actually see the adult there, but the role we were actually observing would to be. see what they were using and how they were questioning themselves. It would have been so easy to jump in and say, oh, yes. well, let's see, how many spoonfuls can you use to fill this bucket? But you didn't because it was his question and he was investigating it in his own way. Quite a lot of confidence yeah. to be able to do that mm. and sometimes you feel as if you're not part of the action, if you're not there in it. And, and again, and the important thing for practitioners is to take those experiences and to say, how do we get the children to ask more questions of themselves about what's happening and how do we then provide and scaffold and support that in their um, future learning experiences? I think that's a learning process for the practitioner as well. Yeah. It is a definite skill that you do pick up. But I think from going from where they are, rather than you assuming what from is. what they know already, yes. and that is done by sort of the observations. Mm. Because you say, we're learning from the children's questions. Exactly. And that, it's so important that you model that learning process. I noticed that Jordan had a really good time with the watering cans. Right, let me just... Write this down in here. Because there wasn't that many resources, but it's something that we could plan in next week. We could maybe get some gutters because, yeah, or... Yeah, we provide them with those resources. But, yeah, yeah. Funnels. Funnels. Chris, do you always scaffold that next stage with putting out more equipment? We do. It's not always about more resources. It's about looking at what the children are learning and putting resources out there that are going to further question them and provide problems for them to solve and work through. So that we can be prepared for all sorts of ways yeah. the children mm. might take it mm. and where their questions might exactly. take it. Exactly, and, and that planning needs to be absolutely responsive to, yeah. to what happens. Yes. If you've planned the term in advance, you're not going it's, to get that spontaneity yes. of learning. There's nothing of the children in there. If no. Exactly, yeah. and you yeah. can't have observed what mm. those children's interests mm. are, what their mm. particular lines mm. of inquiry, their lines mm. of thought are at that moment. It's about 
tuning in to the questions of children yes. and being aware when they're not verbal questions, what is going on? What mm. are they thinking? It's the skill of the practitioner who can scaffold mm -hmm. the direction of the learning that the children still initiate it themselves. Mm. When they have their own agendas that are being followed and supported, that's when really significant fundamental learning takes place. though isn't it when they're not actually saying anything mm. well they were quiet because they were so engrossed. engrossed absolutely but they were questioning through what they were doing the, the girl was seeing how far water would travel that was kind of her little yes. investigation really her exploration mm. and yet there was a leak in the guttering now we could have got very hung up on ah oh, wait you can't do anything because the gut is leaking yes but that didn't bother her but that was led on to different into, learning yeah how far does water spread potion boy who was um, very absorbed with making potions his involvement in that had spread to other children because as he was doing it they were all contributing mm. to his pot and yes. without saying anything without articulating they were just tipping their water in to help him make his potion because they were supporting um, his, mm. his uh, need to do that i was impressed as well how children seemed to understand the question another child was asking mm. because they were supporting mm. them without them necessarily mm. articulating they that were was completely what they tuned in weren't they absolutely yes. you may observe a child thinking they're not actually doing anything there may have been another child watching that mm. and then they will have a go at it themselves mm. the next day but and that, they're and that, asking a question then i was going to say yeah, it, that's yeah. exactly yeah. the point where they're saying why are they doing that i wonder what will happen if i, I do wonder that. what will I happen if I can next do that. yeah if yes. i was doing it i might do it like this There was one child holding the bucket, there was one child pouring water in the top, there was one child going and getting the water from the tap. Really nothing had been said, but they were all completely tuned in to what they wanted to find out. You got the wrong chin! You got them on my hand now. <laughs> Me too! <laughs> Can get it's making a prediction. I think it's going to overflow. Yeah. And then they watched it. Or, yeah. or maybe it's a hypothesis. It's like a scientist. You make a statement, yeah. I am predicting this will happen, when actually they're asking a question. I think it's going to overflow now. All of this water. Ah, no way! From watching this, we then thought about a site that we have that has natural water flowing where they can go and explore it. Again, it's different. <laughs> go over. Is it going to go over? No. Go under it. Yes. Oh. Oh. What are you making? <laughs> So they were able yes. to explore where in the world do I find water? water? It doesn't just come out of a tap. Absolutely. Is it the same? What, would it, what does it feel like? Does it yes. feel the same? And because they go to that site quite often, because it's their forest school site, yeah. they'll know sometimes that it's cold, sometimes um, it, it, it's got rain coming down in it. So it will it change, won't it? 
Mm. The flow, I mean, the day that we went was quite warm and the flow had, had slowed up, but other days they've been there and, and it's been quite a torrent coming across mm. there. Water changes. Yes. If the water you only ever see is the very clear water you wash your hands in, and then you have a very fixed notion of, of what yes. water is. But actually, water that's full of mud is equally water, even though you can't see through it. When does water become mud? And when is it no longer water? Mm. What colour is water? All of that's going on. But it's authentic, it's for a purpose. Is this solid enough to put my foot on, or am I going to mm. sink into it? One of the children is starting to construct a dam, a dam. using the stones, yes. and then pulled in the practitioner to help her get the stones, very much on a supportive playmate type level, and said, "No, that stone's not big enough." I mean, there was a. But to say it's not, not big enough. Big enough. Mm. For it. There's a huge amount of uh, learning apparent in just that statement, in, in the, and in the context of that whole activity. What kind of signs do you want? Thin one. Thin one. Yeah. And developing a real language of water. It's a kind of a language of muddy water. Yes. And really understanding squelching and squirming around. Because they're experiencing yeah. it and living it. And the slidiness of water. So all of those real experiences, based on their interests, based on their explorations and questions, or you've taken it on and you're giving them the real experience so that they can develop a language mm -hmm. that means something for them. Are these any good? <laughs> what happened then when you dropped it in the water? You made the big splash. Should try it again? Yeah. It came from children's motivation. It's the children's idea to explore what water was and what it does and what it feels like and what it sounds like. I made a really big one. Why do you think this is going to make a big... so big. Should we try it? Yeah. It's having that confidence to be flexible and to let the children lead you by their learning, by their questions, rather than planning it out of existence yourself. Yes. And that is one of the things that takes you into having a culture of questioning or a culture of exploring. Yes. The practitioners taking the lead from the children, using the questions of children to guide what they offer and provide and support and enable. Yes. But this doesn't only happen in nurseries, does it? It happens in reception classes mm. and beyond, mm. we hope. No, I think it's um, a very important point to make. This is equally what should be going on in reception classes. Absolutely. And reception practitioners are making judgments of the foundation stage profile. The majority of the evidence they will use will come from observing situations mm. very similar to this. We still need to come back into how we start this. If someone isn't there and isn't... En enabling children to ask these questions, how could they start to do this? Make sure that there are things for children to ask questions about. And the most motivating thing for a child to ask a question about is the real world. But I think an important part is listening to them. So some practitioners keep a questions book to catch the questions, put them into a book, the children use them as inquiries. These are the questions we're asking. Maybe the point is, to some questions, there aren't answers. There are only more questions mm. to extend it further. And that's what an adult needs to provide and scaffold for the next stage. And that's all from Early Years Workshop today. I'd like to thank the panel, and especially Chris, for allowing us into your excellent nursery. And I'd like to thank the nursery and reception children from Stanley Road Primary School in Worcester for their lovely artwork. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>